issues our countries have faced are not purely external, but it also has an internal aspect to it. One of the main drivers of internal security issues in our countries is abject poverty and economic deprivation. We must recognize that one of the reasons that poverty and deprivation create security problems within each of our nations is because these problems can also be concentrated within particular geographical areas or identity groups <coughs> within our nations. Because these economic problems can be drawn along ethnic, religious, and cultural boundaries, they can serve to divide our national population along these lines, thus creating internal conflict and a level of identity. Conflicts of identity can be seen to be particularly tenacious because they bear on values and beliefs that people hold as central to themselves. All of us can find examples of this within our country. In looking at peace and prosperity of the South Asian region, we know that insecurity and instability in one country can have a knock-on effect on the neighboring countries. And in South Asia, we are all neighbors. Therefore, overcoming internal hurdles to national security of each country becomes important to achieve a stable and sustainable degree of regional security. Because as I've already outlined, internal security issues are often driven by economic deprivation. Uplifting the deprived people of any country in the South Asian region stands to benefit the whole region. This upliftment must be undertaken by all of us together. We can all share and learn from each other in replicating the best models that exist for economic upliftment. However, we must remember that we cannot simply transplant these models without consideration for our particular cultural, political, and economic tendencies. We must take great care to first ensure that these models are in alignment with the basic values and assumptions held by our institutions and people. When they are not in alignment, we must amend or refine them so that they are suitable for implement implementation in the South Asian context. Not only will this practice make implementation of economic upliftment measures more effective, but it will also encourage the leadership of South Asian states to begin to identify the unique nature of the challenges being faced in the countries of our region. This sensitivity to context will contribute to creating the foundations of mutual understanding and respect within South Asia. If security is tried to deprivation, then uplifting the economic condition of the region is also the most significant challenge for improving security. This is an important challenge, especially for India, given the sheer size of its population and scale of its economy. But as a result, India has also the greatest potential to upliftment of the region and improve the security of Asia as a whole. Looking closer at solutions to internal conflicts and deprivation, it seems that the central problems are unemployment, housing, low standard of education, poor public health care. If we can collectively make headway in tackling these four problems over the next decade, we will have already strengthened our internal and regional security in a significant let me try to elaborate on two shining examples, both in India and Sri Lanka, which can be used as two excellent programs which will promote economic prosperity through socio-economic development. The housing development program that we have implemented in Sri Lanka, where those families who do not have land are provided with land free of charge. They're also provided with concessionary interest rates and loan packages <coughs> to embark on a massive house building effort. This is a program with special emphasis in the North and East where the civil war had impacted in an extremely detrimental manner 
in the socio-economic standards for the people living in those regions. But this national housing effort entails economic empowerment and promoting an asset-based democracy where people are empowered, supported, and guided to achieve higher standards of living. A good example in this part of the world, in India, is the National Employment, National uh, Rural Employment Guarantee Program, which empowers citizens who are suffering from deprivation and who are destitute in society to climb up the societal lab ladder through various interventions that takes place at the local and at the provincial and state and central levels. Moving away from the question of security, I would like to elaborate again on my earlier point of mutual respect. Earlier I remarked on the importance of mutual respect as a foundation for the relationships between countries in South Asia. Mutual respect in the context of South Asian states entails respecting the sovereignty, political independence, and most importantly, the unity of all member countries. When we talk about the unity of the state, we emphasize the commonality among its people, but we often overlook diversity. However, in reality, we cannot have united countries if we ignore the needs of certain sections of the population. True unity involves a recognition of the diversity that exists within the state. And South Asian countries have significant diversity within them, a kind of diversity that has outpaced Western civilization for a long time. While the West has only recently come to struggle and manage diversity on such a large scale, South Asia has had this challenge for some years. Consider a simple example, often taken for granted by those of us who have always lived in this part of the world. All of us are accustomed to seeing different places of worship in close proximity. In my country, for example, it is not unusual to see a Buddhist temple, a Hindu podium, an Islamic mosque, and a Christian or Catholic church within a few hundred meters of each other. This kind of deep-rooted diversity exists across South Asia, and we cannot overlook it. As mentioned before, it is when diversity is overlooked, when groups of people feel marginalized on the basis of their identity, that unrest and violence prevails. <coughs> Thus, it is evident that two challenges in particular must be addressed in our nations in order to ensure a secure region eradication of poverty, and respect for diversity. How each country addresses these challenges depends on their particular history and resources. I will end with speaking briefly about my own country of Sri Lanka. With regard to eradicating poverty, I have already spoken about some of the initiatives that I myself have been championing in Sri Lanka. In fact, His Excellency the President, Maitri Pala Sirisena, has declared 2017 as the year of poverty eradication. And together with the human leadership provided by our Honorable Prime Minister, we have embarked on a path-breaking national program to achieving substantially in the poverty reduction area. These efforts that are taking place within a larger framework of improving the welfare and structure and employing prospects of the population. With regard to respecting diversity, given our recent history of civil conflict, the next step for our government is to engage with the diversity of our nation in a way that preserves its unity. As a nation, we are now moving forward to redress the mistakes of our past, of political and social injustice that lead to conflict, a conflict from which we have suffered for more than three decades. We are collectively committed to a process of reconciliation with our minority ethnic groups in order to reach a viable and sustainable political solution. The details of this are being debated right now 
in the Sri Lankan Parliament and its committees, even as we speak. We would like to see Sri Lanka becoming an example to the South Asian region, an example in terms of overcoming conflict, respecting diversity, preserving unity, and eradicating poverty. When we do all these things, we fortify our nations from within. And I believe this is the path to build a strong and secure South Asia. Thank you.